I don't think the, the, the unity means cooperation. I think unity means oppression. I well, think sometimes what happened, you look, look, I, I, I don't disagree with that in some sense. I'm saying I mean, all the time. Unity through politics always means oppression because the political system can only be used to silence people and force them to do what they otherwise would not want to do. Otherwise, they would do it on a voluntary basis. So any of these calls of unity, in my view, are, usually, are always sleight of hand to marginalize or oppress a certain population. That now, sometimes sound, that's necessary. Like classic postmodernism, that, that part of postmodernism, that's the fundamental claim of the power theorists, the French power theorists. And there's, there's some... I'm, that's not an insult, by the way. Sure. Um, but, but look, if you take 10 kids and you have them play the same game, all the kids get to play the game, but not all of them get to play the game they wanted to at that moment. But at least they all get to play a game. And so there's cooperation there and there's utility in it. Now you can say, well, the, the tyranny of the game has been imposed, and that's true, but both of those things are true at the same time. And it doesn't seem reasonable to equate cooperation with tyranny. It's reasonable to point out that cooperation could degenerate into tyranny. I think you just kind of uh, um, dropped the mask a little bit because you, in your example, posited these are children. So by its very nature, all these things that you're talking about in a positive sense have to force some group to be a second-class citizen or at least obedient to some kind of elite. Uh, and this is something that I think is the benefits of this, at the very least, are enormously overblown. Uh, I think you can freedom means every kid can play the game that they want. Uh, there might yeah, but not, not be with other people. Jeez. That's the problem. I, that, you know, I, I mean, so and I use children as an example because I was concentrating on games and because it's out of games that the polity emerges over the course of its natural development. So it, it's not a rational top down imposition, all things considered. It's the it's the emergence of a game like structure that incorporates more and more people. And see, the if if you take two year olds, two year olds play their own game. And, and, okay. and each of them plays their own game, but by the time they hit three or four, they have to be able to integrate the game they're playing with, with what other children want to play so that they can play, they can play games with other children, which they're unbelievably motivated to do. And it means that each of them have to subordinate their instincts, so to speak, for the moment, but hypothetically they gain as a consequence of their mutual subordination to this higher order game. I, I don't see it as as support. So if my choices are play this game by myself or play this game I like second with a lot of other people, I I would value this. It's the I'm I'm playing a game in order to have fun. So in that case, the first game, which I which is my most favorite game, if no one wants to play it with me, it's not going to be that fun. So I am, it is rational and not at any sense of subordination to choose my second preferred game because now I'm having fun being able to play it. Well, let's look. I would say that what we're doing here is a is a is a game, and I don't mean that in any you know in any um, what negative sense. You're allowing by participating in this conversation, you're allowing for the possibility and the belief. I would say that whatever we're doing collaboratively is of more utility at the moment than whatever you could be doing individually at the moment, Correct. because otherwise you Correct. wouldn't be doing it. Okay, Correct. so and I would say that we. We are cooperating, we're also competing, and we also might be tyrannizing each other to some degree. But there's something in this mutual interaction that we're about, that we're, we're engaging in voluntarily, that is cooperative, and that isn't being enforced by some external agent. Right. It's entirely cooperative. And this is my whole point. This is why I'm an anarchist, because this is when people are doing things voluntarily, they are going to choose the things that are preferable to them. The problem and when you have conflict is when you have a third actor coming into our conversation and being the state and forcing both of us to do something we would not want to do for their sake. And that when you play that out, that game on a national, international scale, that is the definition of oppression. Instead of you and I having a podcast, why aren't we in the factory making socks for poor people? Uh, that's of more utility, says the you know the third party who's not involved here, uh, and and that's the danger in my view, and the legitimacy well, of that I kind of third party. It is so. The, the development I, I picked up a reasonable number of my ideas about 
the relationship between games and morality and higher order social structures from the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget. And he was interested in the science of ethics, essentially. And his goal was the re reunification of science and religion, actually, and although very few people know that about Piaget. And he pointed out quite clearly that um, a cooperative game would outcompete a tyrannical game over time because the yeah. tyrannical game had to waste resources in enforcement, whereas a cooperative game didn't because people were voluntarily going to go along with it. Um, so th then you say, well, it's, I think you can make a perfectly credible case that if you could choose between two games and one of them involved force and the other didn't, and they had the same end, let's say, that the cooperative game is to be preferred, and it's also more sophisticated. But I would say as well, we actually don't know how to pull that off. It's some of it's yeah. just just lack of ability. Well, when you integrate so many people, like you have Hold 330 on. million people in the United States, it's but really hard, hard to organize a cooperative game. Well, that's the role of the corporate press. The corporate press uh, puts forth the agenda of the power class and gets everyone persuaded to do uh, that which they had wanted to do. Mario Cuomo, whose book I got paid, uh, sorry, uh, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, whose book I got paid to read, he said explicitly in his book that if this wasn't done through voluntary compliance, I wouldn't be able to pull off half of this. And what what ha al what is allowed to happen is you have decentralized enforcement of these uh, rules. And we saw this during the lockdowns where every low status person had an opportunity to assert dominance over somebody else by going up to them and yelling at them that they're not wearing a mask, even though going up to them ostensibly is going to put your life uh, in danger. And just to, you made a very cogent point about how persuasion is a lot cheaper than force. A lot of people use all these Orwellian 1984 comparisons. And I think the comparison to contemporary terms is much closer to Brave New World. And it's through the use of pleasure and the carrot, because it's a lot cheaper to tell people, persuade people it's in their best interest, go along, uh, you're going to give up your freedom, but I'm going to give you safety. And they'll be champing at the bit to do that. H.L. Mencken, the great cynic of the um, early 20th century, uh, said that the average man does not want to be free, he simply wants to be safe. And for those of us who are fans of freedom, who regard liberty as a high value, the issue is how do you engage in a polity with people who don't really find liberty of use and would rather have every minute of their life, whether through their corporate job or what they watch on TV or what they wear, pretty much decided for them. I mean, the um, the speech in The Devil Wears Prada um, that Miranda Priestly makes about how you're wearing that blue sweater because the people in this room you know, chose the cerulean jacket five years ago, then it went to the fringe designers, then it became in the mall, then you found it on clearance. And you think it has nothing to do with you, but it was because we had made these decisions and it percolated down to you. And I think that top-down approach, I mean, Edward, uh, Bernays talked about this, Walter Lippmann talked about this in the books, Pro Propaganda and Public Opinion. This was something that they figured out a hundred years ago, uh, specifically during the Woodrow Wilson administration. How do you get over the complete you know, fascist takeover of the United States, of course, under wartime premises, and get everyone involved in something that would have been completely alien to American thought just five years prior, that we're going to send all our kids over to Europe to fight a European war. This was a major revolutionary shift in how America regarded its relationship between the state and the population and between America and the rest of the world. Woodrow Wilson was the first president to leave America as president. FDR just went to Panama, but that was like America territory at the time uh sorry teddy roosevelt so this was that's what so we've been they've been at this for 100 years so they're playing the long game and now it's starting to fall apart thankfully okay so i i got three things i want to ask you now sure i want to know who they is okay so then i want to know in the devil war prada were you on miranda Priestley's side or on the side of the naive ingenue who you know, was hypothetically tyrannized by her. And now I can't remember the third one. We'll, we'll stick with those two for the time being. So who's the uh, they exactly? Sure. So because it's uh, a shorthand, right? And it's a conspiratorial shorthand. So it's worth, it's worth unpacking. 
Sure. A conspiracy is just an organization that you don't approve of. The Constitutional Convention was a conspiracy. The Founding Fathers got together in Philadelphia to reorganize the Articles of Confederation. That was what they had been their assigned task that they had sworn to. They get in there, lock the doors. They go, yeah, we're starting over, right, guys? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they swore themselves to secrecy. Now, we don't say conspiracy because we don't like that term, but this was very much well, a conspiracy. Okay. Conspiracies usually involve deception and secretiveness, too. So I, they, I, they swore themselves to secrecy. Yeah. Fair enough, and, and there's a conspiratorial element there for sure. But there's lots of things that people do behind the scenes, so to speak, that aren't necessarily conspiratorial because they do them; they're not hiding them. So, but, sure. but back to the they, you know. So basically, so the model is: you get the kids at a, a very young age. Uh, and you put them in government schools. They are taught many things that are nefarious, such as that your self-esteem should be a function of this mediocre person in front of the room, uh, that everyone should have the same work hours, that you're forced to be in a relationship with violent uh, peers that in no other situation are you forced to be locked into a relationship with them with like bullies or just people who are you know disruptive. Um, but this it starts with the universities. And this was by design. The American uh, Economics Association, which was started, I think, in the late uh, 1890s by Richard Eli, who was Woodrow Wilson's mentor. There, and they use they always use Orwellian language. Uh, I'm kind of contradicting myself, but the idea is we're training the next generation of elites. So basically, you have an entire population who go to these best universities who are taught the same faith. And this was, they had something at the time which has degenerated now called the social gospel. Uh, the quote, what would Jesus do, which uh, contemporary Christians say all the time, this was posited by a socialist Christian, because the idea was, instead of uh, in, an individual soul being able to be saved, which was kind of the central idea of Christianity and a big innovation in terms of historical individualism, the premise was, a nation has a soul, and a nation can be saved. Now, once a nation has a soul and can be saved, there is nothing outside your purview. Just like when we're talking about individual soul, the bedroom, the boardroom, how you are in public, these all tie into your salvation. Um, and Eli and other, in, in, um, in the UK, it was the Fabian Society, whose logo was literally a wolf in sheep's clothing. The premise of was, it's kind of Gramsci's March of the Institutions, we're going to train the next generation of leaders, they're going to self-identify as leaders because they have the diplomas and degrees, and they're going to go out there and basically be infect and take over the country, and it's going to be this top-down idea. And you see that it's it's percolated through this day. So you have it starts with the universities, then you have all the journalists and people who work in media who are trained at these universities in the same ideas, and then the final consequence is uh, the politicians. Now, for decades, what had happened was you had the Nancy's Pelosi of the world, go on TV and say, truthfully and honestly, give me money, reelect me, I'm fighting Mitch McConnell and the wicked Republicans. And the Mitch's McConnell went on TV and say, give me money, I'm fighting Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. Meanwhile, while these two are engaging in this pantomime, the New York Times, Harvard, are lobbing grenades over their shoulders and they're not taking any fire at all. What has happened now is people are realizing people like Biden, McConnell, these are puppets of larger actors, and that's where the focus needs to be in terms of effecting change and liberating uh, the West.